Hello and welcome to the final edition of the Left Bench TV for the spring semester. I'm Stephen Malin. And I'm Annabelle Janssens. We're reaching the end of spring sports season here in College Park, but we're still your sideline source for all things Maryland sports. Some teams have capped off their postseason, while two Maryland squads are hotter than ever. Maryland men's lacrosse is just three wins away from holding up its fourth national championship trophy. The Terps played the first round of the NCAA tournament on their home turf at Capital One Field on Sunday. And TLB's Katie Marr was there to catch the hard shells and prove to 13-0 on the season. Thanks, Annabelle and Steven. I was here at Capital One Field where the Maryland men's lacrosse team took on Vermont in the opening round of the NCAA tournament and rolled over them 17-11, advancing to their seventh straight quarterfinal. Jared Bernhardt came out in dominant fashion, totaling six goals on the day, the second most goals scored by a Terp in NCAA tournament history. Up 8-4 at the half, Maryland held the lead for the entire game, and Vermont's six goals in the fourth quarter were not enough to overpower the undefeated Terps. With the win, Maryland has advanced to their seven straight quarterfinals and are now 13-0 on the season. The third-seeded Terps are now headed to Notre Dame to take on the six-seeded Fighting Irish on May 23rd. Back to you guys. Thanks, Katie. John Tillman's squad has even more exciting news this week. Seven Terps have been named to the Inside Lacrosse Media All-American team. Jared Bernhardt, the front runner for the Tawaratan Award, averaging 6.31 points per game, earned the first team All-American honors. Defenseman Nick Rill and Brett Nacar were named to the second team, and Logan Wisnowskis, Roman Puglisi, and Kyle Long made the third team. Goalie Logan McNaney also earned an honorable mention. Now, the Hard Shells aren't the only Maryland team on fire right now. Maryland baseball has racked up three straight home sweeps, winning 11 of their last 12 games and 19 of their last 24. I was at the Bob to catch the Terps wrap up their most recent series, and it was quite the sweep. I'm here at the Bob where the Terps baseball have continued their terrific stretch of play with strong outings from Sean Burke and Elliot Zellner. The Terps rolled past Purdue 7-2, sweeping the Boilermakers and securing their 10th straight home victory. Purdue hopped out to an early 1-0 lead in the first, but Matt Shaw made sure to tie things right back up with a homer to straightaway center in the bottom half of the inning. And after a couple of singles and a Purdue error, Tommy Gardner would hit a two-run triple and eventually score, putting the Terps up 4-1. Sean Burke and Elliot Zollner battened down the hatches, with the two pitchers combining for eight strikeouts and only five hits through nine innings. This victory over Purdue has Maryland sitting at fourth place in the Big Ten, and the Terps have won 19 of their last 24 games. With yet another series victory for Maryland baseball, the Terps seem to be peaking at the right time before the postseason. They'll play two more series before the playoffs, facing off in Ann Arbor next against Michigan, and then coming back home to close out the season against Indiana. While Rob Vaughn's team is looking electric right now, they still have two series left in their regular season. Our Reese Levin spoke with Maryland Baseball Network broadcaster Ben Curtis to get his take on what's been working for the team, who's standing out, and if the Terps could be on the way to the NCAA tournament. Thanks, Steven. I'm now joined by Maryland Baseball Network broadcaster Ben Curtis to talk about the final home stretch of the season for this Maryland baseball team. So, Ben, this team has been on a tear recently, sweeping their last three opponents at home. What's been working well for them? Well, they just become a really well-rounded ball club, Reese. At the beginning of the season, when the offense worked, the pitching wasn't really clicking and vice versa. But now, just about everything's going on both sides of the ball. They've turned into a really bona fide superstar in Ben Cowles from a really solid player in 2020 to one of the best in the Big Ten in 2021 and a real contender for Big Ten player of the year. The pitching staff has been excellent and the bullpen has really grown into its own this year. Yeah and speaking of Ben Cowles like you said he's had a breakout year. He's leading the conference with 16 home runs and he leads the team in RBIs. How much of an impact has he had this year? Well, he's been huge, especially with the injuries that Maryland has had with Randy Bedno and Maxwell Costas going down. Haven't really seen the production from Maxwell Costas this year that we thought we might have at the start of the 2021 campaign. Ben Cowell started the season in the number six spot in the lineup. He's moved up to the number three spot in the order with all the injuries, and he really hasn't missed a beat. He is uh, one of the top three contenders in my book for Big Ten Player of the Year. Now switching gears here, uh, who, who, in the, who on the pitching staff has really stood out to you this season? Well, Jason... Sabacool has been absolutely huge for Maryland. The freshman to be able to have multiple complete games under your belt, work deep into games, and especially as a back end of the weekend starter, Saturday, Sunday, to be able to go long into games and save up that bullpen for a Friday night game to use those high leverage guys like Ryan Ramsey and Sam Bellow has been huge. So for a freshman to be able to have the confidence to go out and do that and for Rob Vaughn to be able to throw a freshman in any situation 
it's absolutely huge for Maryland, and he's really given depth to the rotation. Yeah, Savicol's been huge, and like you said, he's only a freshman, so uh, hopefully more to come from his, from the young arm. Now, this team is currently ranked fourth in the Big Ten standings and only has two more series left in this conference-only schedule against Michigan and Indiana, both of whom are ranked higher than the Terps. And in the most recent projections by D1Baseball.com, they have the Terps in the NCAA tournament. Do you think this team can still make it even if they don't fare well in their in their final two series? Well, this is games? a fantastic last two weekends. It's going to be really interesting. It's almost a de facto Big Ten tournament that we don't get one, but Maryland's going to play two of the two best teams in the entire conference the last two weekends. I think of the six games, they need to come away with at least three wins if they're able to do so, especially a home series win against a really good Indiana club the last weekend of the series. It's going to put them in a really, really solid position heading into uh, the selection day. If they only win two or fewer of the games, and if one of the score lines get away from them, if one of them turns into a blowout, might be some sleepless nights for Rob Vaughn's team the rest of the way. Yeah, we will have to wait and see how this team or where this team fares going into the NCAA tournament. Ben, thanks so much for hopping on with me. Thanks, Reese. Back to you, Annabelle. Thanks, Reese. The women's lacrosse team's run in the postseason came to a heart clenching end on Sunday against High Point. The Terps were dominant in the opening round of the NCAA tournament on Friday, but Sunday's second round matchup against seventh seeded Duke told a different story. Down 9 to 6 at halftime, the Terps made a comeback, and Hannah Lubecker brought it to a one goal game with just under two minutes left. But in the end, Maryland fell 13 to 12. With the season now over, our Tino Qualiata spoke with Pesudo Times women's lacrosse beat reporter Joe Latano about what fans can look forward to next year. Thanks, Annabelle and Steven. And now I'm so happy to be joined by Joe Latano. He's the Maryland women's lacrosse beat writer for Testudo Times. Joe, as you know, the Terp season came to an end on Sunday with a 13-12 loss to Duke in the NCAA tournament. How did the Blue Devils come out on top in, in this close match? And what else do we know about the game? Um, well, it was really about Duke's versatility on offense, um, for starters. They had nine different scores. Um, they really put a lot of pressure on Maryland to uh, try and come back in that game. Um, Maryland led one nothing at start and then didn't lead the rest of the game, basically. Um, that was a testament to Duke's versatility on offense, but also their defense. They really held Maryland in check. Maryland didn't have any scoring runs other than um, one run at the end of the first half and their comeback towards the end that ultimately fell short. Maryland finished the season at 10 wins and seven losses, which is good for a 588 winning percentage. This is unheard of for a Terp squad led by Kathy Reese. What was different this year that resulted in them finishing 10 and seven? Yeah, well, uh, for starters, definitely the schedule. Um, only playing Big Ten opponents because of the COVID restrictions um, definitely hurt them in the long run. Um, they had to play uh, Popkins and Northwestern three different times in the season. Um, both were tournament teams. Uh, they were just scrappy games and the wear and tear definitely showed um, across the whole conference, except for Northwestern. Um, all the teams were really beating each other up. So although it was, it was a disappointing season for the Terps, they're always loaded with talent. Who, who stood out for the Terps this year and are any of them returning next year? So for starters, uh, Hannah Lou Becker, she was an absolute stud on the offense. She led the team 58 goals, had an absurd stretch um, in the beginning of late, fe no, late February, beginning of March. Um, and yeah, she, she was a force to be reckoned with. She really burst onto the scene this year. And also returning players, Grace Griffin and Tori Beretta, they're using their extra eligibility due to COVID. And um, they're going to offer some really nice uh, leadership on the defense and midfield. Yeah, having Grace Griffin back in the midfield is definitely going to help um, the top 10 recruits uh, coming in. There's three midfielders coming in, in the class of 2021, so she will be able to really mentor those guys. And I think Coach Reese would say for herself that no matter what, this Terps team is always competing for a national championship. So I'm just really excited to see this team play a full schedule again. And um, so, Joe, thanks so much for, for joining me here, and uh, have a good one. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Back to you guys at the desk. Thanks, Tino. After clinching the series with a win on both Friday and Saturday, the Maryland softball team wasn't able to secure the sweep when they wrapped up their regular season on Sunday, but they did celebrate their seniors. TLB's Travis Chase was there to catch the special day for Mark Montgomery's squad. Thanks, Annabelle and Steven. 
Terps came into today's game looking to win their third game out of four in the series against the Indiana Hoosiers and to also send their seniors out on a high note. The Terps got off to a slow start against Indiana, allowing two runs in the top of the fourth. The Terps would then answer with two runs of their own in the bottom of the fourth. One run would come from a hit and the other from a defensive error. Indiana would score in the top of the sixth to take a 3-2 lead. Indiana would then end up taking the game 3-2. Reporting from Robert E. Taylor Stadium, I'm Travis Chase. Back to you, Annabelle and Steven. Thanks, Travis. While the softball season has come to an end, another Maryland team is continuing their run on a not-so-subpar note. For the first time in program history, the women's golf team is advancing to the NCAA golf championships. This news comes after the cancellation of the regional rounds due to inclement weather. The women's golf team has had a strong season, finishing in the top three at all seven tournaments this year, including second place at the Big Ten Championship. The Terps have earned a fifth seed in the Nationals, which will take place this weekend in Scottsdale, Arizona. Speaking of Arizona, former Maryland basketball star Jalen Smith made a name for himself in the Phoenix Suns regular season finale, making him a clear winner for this, for this week's Pro Turf. On Sunday, Sticks and the Suns took on the Spurs, winning by a two-point margin, but that wasn't the highlight of the night. It was Smith's first career NBA start, and he racked up 11 points, 10 rebounds, two assists, and one block in 41 minutes of playing time. That marks the first career double-double for the former Terp in the NBA. But Sticks isn't the only pro Terp to be excited about right now. After being drafted in the seventh round to the Rams, former star Maryland running back Jake Funk made it official on Saturday. And on Monday, he kicked off minicamp in Los Angeles. Funk's journey to the NFL wasn't an easy one, battling injuries and adversity. Our Katie Marr spoke with Jake and his brother Josh Funk about what it took to achieve his dream and how he's preparing for this next chapter in his life. You know, we were we were headed into what was going to be kind of a make or break season, right? This uh, this this senior season for him uh, was something that he had placed a lot of weight on. When Maryland running back Jake Funk suffered two ACL tears in the same knee, he turned to his brother, physical therapist Josh Funk, to help him make his way back to the field. It is very rare that I have a long history with somebody before I get to spend time with them. So I think if anything. Uh, having an appreciation for Jake and his psychology um, and knowing how he operates, I think that really, really goes a long way. Despite a shortened COVID season, Jake made his hard work and recovery worth it, totaling 516 rushing yards, 68 in receiving, and four total touchdowns in just four games. It was here at Capital One Field that Jake ran in his first touchdown of that make or break season. And now, just six months later, he's NFL bound. Who is it? Les, Les. Oh my God. I'm going to LA. I'm going to LA. In the seventh round of the 2021 NFL draft, with the 233rd overall pick, Jake got the call of his life, and LA is about to get funky. I, I was in shock. I was just like, uh, like, like, just kind of like not thinking it's real, right? When you got the call and you're sitting there waiting, 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 and then you see your name on the TV and it's like, whole, it's like, holy crap, like that is real. Um, and that's something, that's a moment you dream about as a little kid. Um, you know, you, you watch NFL draft every year, you see guys getting the phone call and um, the reactions by the friends and the family. And I mean, it's just, it was just such a surreal moment. With his dream now achieved, Jake is thankful for the time he was able to spend with his brother in PT. I'm very blessed, very fortunate to be able to, to, to have a brother who's a physical therapist. You know, it, he was able to push me on a different level, right? Because he knew me growing up. He's no, he knows everything about me. And now he's looking forward to fighting for his spot on the Rams roster. Wherever they feel is the best fit for me, um, owning that role and then in hopes that I can, you know, continue to earn more and more opportunities there on offense, on special teams, whatever it is. Um, so just going in there with an open mind and trying to contribute and help this team win in any way that I can. Now, Jake Funk had plenty of awesome plays during his time with Maryland football and Sunday's lacrosse game against Vermont was filled with its share of, in of insane plays by the number one Turks but one standout simply had to be our play of this week. Take a look as Logan Wisnowskis takes a few steps back and dishes to Kyle Long, 
who quietly tosses the ball behind his back off the turf and right past the Vermont goalie for Maryland's 14th goal of the, af of the afternoon. What a play by Long, who finished with a hat trick on Sunday. And that'll just about do it for the final edition of the Left Bench TV for this year. And that also marks the end of a great four years for our Annabelle Jansons. Yes, yeah, Stephen, it's been the most amazing four years here at the Left Bench, and I'm so excited to see what you guys do in the future. Be sure to keep up with all of our coverage over the summer at the Left Bench on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. We'll see you in September.